a seat. Make yourself at home. <clears throat> so, it is not asked that you believe them. Okay? I'm probably going to say a lot of things that will sound rather strange tonight. <clears throat> what is asked is that you stop the mind's habit of agreeing or disagreeing with everything that it hears. Both of these are to not hear what is said. If you agree with what I say, then you didn't hear it. <clears throat> it means that you filed it away in the brain with a bunch of stuff that you already believe you know. But not to be offensive, but if you really knew that stuff, you wouldn't be here. Okay. Um, you would be out doing the things that we're talking about tonight. And if somebody invited you to such a meeting, you would say, why? <laughs> And if you disagree with them, uh, it's obvious that you didn't hear them, but most people don't understand that they don't hear things also by agreeing with them. What is asked of you is that you simply call them an idea, which may be true to the speaker, but to you it is an opinion. The minute you get it, it becomes opinion. And that you hold it until the proper time comes when you can check it out for yourself. What is said about the teaching ideas is that they only have an effect on a person if the person finds out for themselves. So it's not enough just to be told. You have to actually find out for yourself whether it's true. In other words, the very act of finding out for yourself that it's true changes you. <clears throat> it's said that one that works with these ideas becomes an entirely new kind of person. So if that's what we want, is to be a different kind of person than the one we are now, then the way to work with them is this, okay? I neither agree nor disagree. Even if it sounds like something I know, I say, I don't know. It's just an opinion. And one day I will find a way to check it out and see if it's true. <clears throat> a lot of the stuff that I'm going to talk about tonight, we may not have the opportunity to check out for some time. Because some of it is kind of out there, <laughs> okay? Some of it we can begin <clears throat> checking out immediately. But some of it perhaps we will not be able to. So we just have to say, okay, this is an interesting opinion. I'm going to see if I can find out for myself that maybe these ideas come from a higher intelligence than this wacko who's telling me about them and experiment with them when I have the opportunity to see if they're true. Okay? Does that make sense? <clears throat> I'm not trying to discourage questions, you understand. If you don't understand something, then feel free to ask questions. Just interrupt. I don't care. <clears throat> but I am not going to get involved in an argument about whether I'm right or wrong. Because um, I'm perfectly content with what I know about these things. And I really don't care whether you believe me or not. Okay? So I probably will not argue about whether they're right or wrong. I will perhaps maybe try to explain it a little better if you're having trouble understanding it, though. They're not my ideas, so what do I care? <clears throat> there are a few things that we have been told that I want to look at tonight. I'm not saying these are the only things we've been told that we need to look at, but there are a few things I want to look at to start off with that are incredible lies that we've been told about life on planet Earth that's caused the most ridiculous ideas to be set up, all based on lies. And if you understand reasoning just a little bit, you know that if you start with a lie, Nothing that you reason from that point on is going to make any sense, isn't that right? Well, that's all it takes is one lie, and we're going to look at several. <clears throat> so you start to understand that the way that we look at living here is just flat out wrong, if you can sort of check these ideas out. <clears throat> the first one is that the creation is finished. That is one of the things that we have been told and believe, isn't that right? 
<clears throat> that the creation is finished, and now what happens is people get born into it. <clears throat> Isn't that what you've been told so far? It's not true. In fact, the very story that many people use to demonstrate that the creation is finished makes it very clear that it is not. Remember that old story that says that uh, <clears throat> the Creator spent six days creating the universe? You've heard that story before? Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of people who have big arguments about that because it's obviously silly. Isn't that right? <clears throat> because if you buy that story, then it means that mankind should only be a few thousand years old. And therefore, the entire universe should be a few thousand years old. Isn't that right? It should be a few thousand years old plus five days. <laughs> and it's not. <clears throat> so you have to believe in this really kind of prankster, capricious, bizarre guy who said, I'm going to trick him. I'm going to make it so it looks really old. <laughs> Boy, is it going to boggle their minds. I mean, that's ridiculous, isn't it? It doesn't seem to occur to anybody that maybe his days aren't the same as the amount of time it takes the Earth to rotate around the little sun in the midst of the creation. But he's got a whole different concept of what a day is. Obviously, his days are trillions of years long, from our point of view. I mean, it's just a simple thing, isn't it? Okay, he said it took him six days. I'm not going to argue with him. He was there. I wasn't. <laughs> But it's real clear he didn't mean the kind of day that I know about. All right? Now, if we can accept that simple little thing, that when he said it took him six days, we'll accept that he was telling the truth and that we can see how that could be true. But obviously, we don't live on the same time scale. That's fine. Then what's the rest of the story? That he said on the seventh day he took rest. Well, that was kind of like just after he created man, isn't that right? So if a day is trillions of years long, do you suppose that the seventh day is still going on? Does that sound about right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> that you and I will never see the end of his seventh day? So the creation is not finished. He's just resting. But we've all bought. A bunch of people told us that what that story means is that it took him six days to do it, and then he took, took off and said, let's see whether you guys make it to heaven or hell. I'll see you later, but I'm out of here. <coughs> Another possible way of looking at it is that he's just taking a day off, and it's not done yet. <coughs> and that... Uh, Actually, what's going on is that he expects us to finish it. What a bizarre concept, huh? <clears throat> that he didn't just make us as this kind of little joke to see whether or not he had a bunch of people to torture for eternity <laughs> and a few that he could take off to some special place and <laughs> congratulate them that they missed that other terrible fate. <laughs> <laughs> but that there is something for us to do. That we, we have a place in all of this. Okay. Kind of a little different take on some things that we've known all of our lives in one form. <clears throat> one of the consequences of that is that I believe that I'm incomplete. Isn't that about right? Just about everybody that I met has this feeling inside themselves that there's something missing, that they're not quite finished. Well, that's because it's true. <laughs> we've been told that everything is done so it doesn't make sense to us how can this be if I'm finished then how come I feel like something is missing 
And so we've made up all sorts of bizarre things out of that to try and deal with this contradiction. <clears throat> now, there's an old saying amongst folks who deal with these ideas that everything in this world is a parable of something in the inner world, which means it is similar but not the same. And it's sitting out here acting similar so that you can see something inside here. That everything out here is a reflection of something that's going on in our inner worlds, okay? So we have this lovely parable sitting in the midst of the outer world, because that's the way it was made, so that we could sort of catch on, you know, um, <clears throat> of a way to feel complete. You know what that is? Well, I know you do. <laughs> Sex. Haven't you ever had that feeling in the middle of, of the sex act that for one little instant you feel complete? You feel like you've joined with someone else and you are complete for that instant. What is that there for? To tell you that the reason you feel incomplete is because part of you is missing. And in that occasional, it doesn't happen all the time, but occasionally in the sex act, you get that sense of union with the other person, and it says what you're missing is something in you, another presence in you that you normally don't ever experience, isn't that right? And the sex act makes it really clear. Now, rather than dealing with this, and saying, oh, okay, that's useful information now. At least I have some idea of what to do to deal with this incompletion. <clears throat> we decided to counterfeit it and say, no, 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 you missed the point. <clears throat> that is completion. To bond with another person in this romantic way, and then you will be complete and your life will be perfect. And so we've made this big, mis mysterious, mystical thing out of what? Reproduction. We've turned a simple, necessary thing about being in a body into this gigantic, mystical thing where you have to do it certain ways or you'll miss out on the point of it, and you have to do it only under certain conditions and at the right time with the right person, and all this weird stuff because we decided that we would, did not want to see that this was just a parable to point out where we were to look for completion. Not in sexual union, because, I mean, geez, you can't walk around doing that, you know, every damn second of the day, can you? But it at least tells you what's missing, a presence in your life of something else. Isn't that right? It doesn't say this is the way to get it. It just says where it's, what it is that's missing. <clears throat> so we've come up with all these weird ideas, you know, that there is one other person out there who is your other half. Because when I do find somebody and I get that, you know, it's temporary and it goes away and maybe I never get it with that person again, so I say, whoops, they were the wrong one. So there's one person out there that is your soulmate, your other half, and my favorite little way of saying this is now all you have to do is go through three billion frogs to find a princess. Isn't that right? I mean, what a needle in a haystack game that is. It's goofy, isn't it? Because we missed the point. So we don't know what it is that would complete me. And many of us have tried to pretend that it's not even true. Many of us have made the mistake of thinking that it's in a romantic sexual union with someone. <clears throat> and many of us have simply decided to say, it's not even true. I feel incomplete, but it's just, you know, because I'm not strong enough or knowledgeable enough or whatever, okay? And that if only I had more of strength and knowledge or whatever, was more successful, <clears throat> whatever, then this would go away. But it is just a fact. I'm incomplete. I'm unfinished, just as the entire creation is. 
it is my job to finish myself because he's taking a rest. The creator is on a break. <laughs> <laughs> and the beauty of this game is that by being a part of my own creation, I become like the creator, do I not? I become a creator by creating myself to begin with. So the old promise that says, that if you play the game the way I set it up, this is the creator speaking, then you will become like me. It is just that, a promise. It's not just a funny story that people tell. It's what he said. <clears throat> now if we look at a human being, we can see very clearly <clears throat> what the part is that is missing that makes us feel incomplete. And the joke is it's not actually missing. That's actually the good part. Because if it were really missing, I don't know, I think we'd have a real hard time dealing with this. But if we look at a human being, <clears throat> we see that a human being has a physical body. That's the obvious part. And it has what most of us call mind, but around here we use a technical word called awareness for that. Because what people call mind um, <coughs> is what I call a radio that doesn't have an off switch. And that is not exactly what I mean when I say awareness, okay? The awareness certainly uh, is aware amongst other things of the ongoing noise that comes from the mind, isn't it? But it is not the mind. It's mind in another sense than the way we think about it. There's all this yammering that goes through the head. Okay. It is the part of me that experiences all the stuff that's going on. Okay. In other words, the part that says I. And there is another part of me that I am completely unaware of that we normally call the biological aspect of man. Because we don't see that just as I am an invisible spirit called awareness that lives in a physical body, there is yet another physical, or excuse me, invisible spirit that lives in here with me, that runs the body. Because I sure don't do that. I have no idea how this body works. I don't know how to use it <clears throat> in the sense of doing all the dirty details. I just know how to say what I want to do, isn't that right? And I have no idea how it gets done. I say, well, I'm going to talk to some people tonight, and I have no idea how to make the mouth move and the larynx work and the air go in the right way. I, you know, I just don't know how that works. I probably couldn't even give you a good description of it. But this other part that shares this experience of being a human being with me knows exactly how to run the body. Why? Because it made it. This is the creator. Around here we call it X to remind ourselves that we don't know nothing about it. It's an unknown to us. We've heard rumors about it. We've heard stories about it. But we obviously know nothing about it because it shares every moment with me. Everything that I say I want to do, it actually does. Not me. <clears throat> In the last few hundred years, we've made up some interesting stories about autonomic nervous systems and things like that, which is called begging the question, isn't it? We still have no idea how all that stuff works, but we found some mechanisms that make us believe that it's all automatic. So we don't need the presence of the Creator in that form to make it work. It never seems to occur to us that maybe the Creator's kind of lazy. And so he put a lot of automatic functions in there so that all he had to do is kind of like push a button and the rest did itself, you know. But still somebody's got to push that button. So part of the teaching is a description of the way that we call this sometimes, by the way, the life principle. Because 
It is very clear when it is in matter, isn't it? And it's very clear when it ain't. When X leaves a body, it's pretty obvious because it sort of like falls down and starts smelling bad, falls apart. <laughs> Doesn't do what living bodies do anymore. See, this is life itself, in other words. It's whatever that unknown thing is that we really don't know, do we? That when it's present in a body, we say that body is alive, and when it takes a hike, we say we have an unpleasant chore. Okay. <coughs> and the teaching tells us that the way that these bodies work is that they exist in some sort of environment. body is constantly sensing what is going on in that environment and reporting it to the awareness. Isn't that right? Everything that the body senses is just passed on to the awareness. That's called reporting. And last I heard it says, okay, I felt this, I smelled this, I saw this. But it's the awareness that actually deals with all that information, isn't it? Not the body itself. This invisible spirit that inhabits the body is what actually deals with all the information that comes from the senses, okay? <clears throat> and there is a certain amount of sensory stuff that comes from inside the body that does not tell me about the environment, tells me about the body itself, which is actually another kind of environment as far as I'm concerned. This body is my environment, really, isn't it? But there's a little bit of information that comes inside, thank goodness, it's very um, rudimentary. It says things like, um, this doesn't feel okay, or this does, isn't that about right? That's about all you get. You don't get details. Not like you do out here. Out here you get all these details about what's going on. In here it just sort of says, well, it seems to be working pretty good today. And then a little while later it says, well, the stomach's empty, why don't you do something about it? That's about all it tells you, isn't that right? Thank goodness. It's hard enough dealing with all the information you're about out here without dealing with all the stuff that goes on in here. I'm real glad it's just real simple stuff. <laughs> okay, it means I can deal with out here. <clears throat> and the awareness, according to the teaching ideas, has two things that it is to do with this information. One is to decide what is true because the senses are not perfect. Just because I sense something does not make it so. Okay. <clears throat> you can have the sensory impression that little buggies are crawling on your body, can't you? That doesn't mean they're there, does it? Many times you go to brush off buggies and you look down and there's nothing there. Isn't that right? And that's not even talking about bigger things like the senses telling us that the world is flat when it's not. So the awareness is to check everything out that comes to the senses and say, is it true? <clears throat> How can I deal with my environment if I don't know what's true? So that's the first job of awareness, isn't it? And the second job is to say what is valuable about it. Now, the way that we normally do that is we decide whether what I'm sensing is good or bad, isn't that right? But the idea is that I put some kind of value on this. So if I sense that the light is kind of gone, I put some value on it, and the next thing you know, I'm turning on a light or lighting a fire or something because I decided I wanted light. That's called valuing. <clears throat> and the way it actually works is that anything the awareness says is both true and valuable is reported to X. The awareness has now done its job. It's been aware. <clears throat> it's uh, I accept that this sensory impression is true, and here's the value that I put on it. Maybe the value is I want it to change. Maybe the value is I really like this. Maybe the value is I want it to go away. Okay, but there's always some kind of value on it, isn't that right? And just for your information, when this value is put on it, we then get what is known as a feeling or an emotion. Um, 
that is our feedback about the kind of valuing that we put on this moment. If I feel good emotionally, it means that I'm valuing this moment very highly. When I feel bad, it means I wish it would sort of go away. I don't like it too much. But anytime we make a value decision about something, we always get a feeling. Okay? That's just the way these bodies work. <clears throat> and that feeling is actually what communicates to X. Not the thinking of the awareness. Because a lot of times there is some thought goes into this, isn't there? I may think about what I'm sensing for a while to see if it's true. I may think about a way to value it. But what X hears is the feeling that happens when that value decision is finally made. It doesn't hear all the thinking. That goodness. Can you imagine how nuts he would go? Yeah, <laughs> listen to all that. <laughs> and then what happens is that X acts. So we say that X then does the appropriate thing for what the information, or the, what the awareness said is true and valuable. But that, of course, isn't the way we experience it, is it? I believe that I decide to walk, and so I walk. I don't see this other invisible spirit in my life that I'm in constant communion with, saying, here's what's going on in my world, here's what I care about, that does everything for me because I don't know how. That's invisible to me. It's going on every single second. You've probably heard before that some people have said that God is as close to you as your next breath. Why? Because he's going to breathe it for you. <laughs> I know people have tried to make really mystical things out of this. Well, let's see. There's this prana, you know, this energy that floats around in the air, and when you breathe it in, it gets you close. No, no, no. It's real simple, okay? He's the one who breathed. You don't got to make up mystical energy in the air that connects you with God and all this sort of stuff. It's just they said that because who do you think is doing the breathing? Not you. In fact, most of the time, I bet you aren't even aware that you're breathing. If it were left up to you, you'd suffocate. <laughs> <laughs> Thank goodness he knows how to pay attention better than we do. <laughs> <laughs> so this says X does the appropriate thing for the information received from its awareness function. No one has ever been able to prove this wrong. Every time it's ever been checked out by someone who decides to use these ideas, it is always seen that everything that X does is always appropriate when seen in the long run. Now, many times we look at it and we say, God, how stupid. And then three years later, we look back and say, oh, I get it. <laughs> so apparently, this is a pretty smart guy. Because a lot of times we look at what X does and we say, oh, that was stupid. <clears throat> but he has his own little way of looking at things. We just say, here's what's going on, and X does what's appropriate. So some people have called X infinite intelligence. Apparently this X thing has a lot of different attributes. That's why we call it X, to remind ourselves, no matter how much we know, we probably know very little, <laughs> okay? Because it's got a lot of different attributes. <clears throat> now, if I look at this little picture that is given to us to describe the way that we actually function, can you see why a person feels incomplete? Mm -hmm because 99% of what I am, since this is infinite, <laughs> I don't even experience. It's not even in my life. 
and I wonder what's missing from my life. It's called a constant relationship with the Creator of all things, including me. And you can see why the parable would be in sexual union, can't you? It's to remind you that what you really want is union with another being. But I can't do that with another human being. It's a pretty story, but it's impossible. There's some really good reasons for that. We simply cannot do it. There's some wonderful things we humans can do together. But experience union? No way. It's just not possible. I can feel very close to you sometimes. Not always, but sometimes. I can experience great intimacy with you. But I cannot get one with you. Thank goodness, actually. I'm not sure that I would really want that. If somebody came up and said to me, Phil, I can be one with you. I think I'd run like hell. It's like, well, then what will happen to me? I'm not sure I want to be one with you. I kind of like this where, you know, you're separate, but we have a good time. I like this game. I like the intimacy of it. I enjoy that experience of feeling free to be open about things in this life that you know nothing about. If you were one with me, what would be the fun? You'd already know. What would be the point? So I think what we're actually looking for is to be able to experience the presence of this in my life all the time. That, I think, would give me that sense of completion that I long for. And so much of the teaching ideas is about what it takes to change myself into the kind of person who can do that and not just yak about it. Because there are lots of people all over this planet that claim that, don't they? Oh, I have a personal relationship with God. And you look at their lives and you say, good <laughs> grief. What kind of God is it? <laughs> and that change is called finish creating me. Okay? I'm unfinished. And that's why I don't have that sense of this. Since this is an invisible spirit, I cannot perceive it with any sense that I have right now. Isn't that right? Any more than I can look at you and see the awareness that is in you. I can see its effects and say, there must be one there. But I can't look at you and see that invisible spirit inside you that is the awareness part that's doing the show, all I can see is its effects. Isn't that right? The way it moves the body, the way it holds it, the way it holds the facial muscles. I can tell a lot about what it's feeling and what it's doing. Isn't that right? But I can't see it. It's invisible to me. And X is another spirit. So in this unfinished state that I'm in, I simply do not have the ability to experience this, much less feel a close relationship with it so I can say I feel complete. It just isn't in me. The body is not done yet. Okay? Does that make sense? So a lot of the teaching is about doing something that will finish the job of creation it was started. But it's up to you. Now, it does say, of course, that X will actually do it. Isn't that right? But I have to kick it off by saying, this is what I want. X will not do it for me. He's on holiday. <laughs> I have to say, you, you can see that even on holiday, he's a pretty busy guy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> since he's sitting here running the whole show still, he just said, I'm not creating today. If you want creation to continue for you personally, you're going to have to say, hey, I, I want it and I'll do part of the work because I'm taking a rest. He didn't say he was not going to do anything. 
<coughs> he just said, I'm taking a rest, okay? So you're going to have to tell me you want to do this. I'm not just going to do it. This is my day off. The other idea, which I have really already kind of said, is that I believe that I'm already created. Just as I believe that the creation is finished, I believe that I am already created. And that is not true. I am not. I am an uncreated being. Now let me put this to you in nice physical terms, okay? Um, this one is in the middle of writing a book right now. <clears throat> so if I show you a few pages of notes and a few little pages that have been written and I say, here's the book, it's done, would you have a nice laugh? <laughs> or would you say, no, I'm sorry, you're still making it. You're still creating it. It ain't done. It's just a few pages of notes and outlines and maybe two or three actual written pages. That's not exactly my idea of done. You kind of get the point. Just because you're in the middle of being created doesn't say that it's created. Of course there's stuff to show. I could show you things about the book. I, I got lots of stuff right now. It's not a book. But I have lots of pages of notes and outlines and things I want to say and the way I want to say it. But there's very little of it that's actually written. You see what I'm saying? So the fact that I have something to show you doesn't mean it's finished, does it? Because in life, things are a process. Creation is not an instantaneous act, is it? It's a process of growth. That's why it's called life. The last time I checked, that's what life does. You know, it starts out with some little thing, and it grows from there. But somehow we look at the body, which is the only part that we can see, and it appears to us that it's finished. By the way, it's not. Strangely enough, the body is not even finished yet. But it appears to us that it is with our limited senses, because we're not finished, so, you know, what do we know? There are lots of things that we can't even sense. And so we get this illusory idea that I'm created. And it's not true. It might be accurate to say I'm in the middle of creating myself, but it is not true to say I'm created. I'm actually still an uncreated being. <clears throat> and a lot of what the teaching is, is about is about finishing that act of creation, about giving us the information that we need to finish the job. Not that most of us seem too interested. <laughs> but for those who are, the information is there that says, here's what it takes to finish the job of creating yourself. This incredible being made sure that that information was always available to those who want it. Many choose not to do that. They're quite happy living out this, their lives in this incomplete, uncreated state. That is fine with them. And there are some who say, this is not good enough for me. <laughs> I do not want to spend the rest of my life incomplete and uncreated, whether they come up with these words or not. And so they find out that somehow or another the teaching comes into their life to give them what they need to finish. So I've mentioned what the counterfeit of this is, which is that since all we can sense is the physical form, we assume that the creation is done for each of us individually because it appears to us that so we remain satisfied with having a body. And we think that if there's anything left for me to do, it's to develop skills about living here so that I can become successful. Is that right? And we'll talk a bit in a few moments after I've sort of developed this overview 
about what successful actually means to us is rather amusing. At least I think it is. Okay. But that's what we think finishing the job of our creation means. To develop skills here in the physical world, this place that we're going to stay in, you know, for the blink of an eye. The most transitory thing there is. We'll get really good at dealing with the physical world, which we're going to leave shortly anyway, and say, ah, I finished myself. It never seems to occur to us that this is just like a place to come to finish yourself and that you're going somewhere else. And so whatever skills you get about living on the earth world is very nice while you're here. But what good is it going to do you if you go somewhere that isn't like the earth world? No matter how successful you become here, what difference does it make if you're leaving? It's kind of like somebody who gets really good at sitting in train stations. <laughs> Funny, isn't it? <laughs> Why, I'm so good at it, I could spend years in the train station. <laughs> well, that's nice. Do you ever think about leaving one day? Seeing what's outside? You got the chance. The other illusion that we have that's pretty strong is that mankind itself is finished. This is an individual of mankind, but we believe that mankind's evolution is done. In other words, that mankind has been created. That also is not true. Mankind is in the midst of, in fact, mankind is actually less finished than you are. Did you know that? <clears throat> because mankind right now is in the midst of building its form. It hasn't even finished building the body that's going to hold it. It doesn't even know what form to give to its own greater self, which is all of us here together. It's really clear right at this particular moment in history, because we're living in a time where there is an incredible revolution in value systems going on, where every few years the value systems change dramatically, isn't that right? We don't know what form to put to life on planet Earth at this point in time, because that's actually the, process, the stage of the process that mankind's evolution is in. It is time to create the form for mankind. Yeah? Does this static system, if we assume that, that the awareness decides what is true, feeds it to X that is the creator, or we are constantly changing, in some anomalous... Well, not just we. Everything, everything is constantly <laughs> changing. That's... Yeah, what about it? I'm sorry. Is, uh, do free will and preordination both exist somehow in this nope. <clears throat> Free will is an unrealized potential in man until he creates himself. You have no free will at this point in time. It doesn't even exist. Yeah. It's just that simple. And there really is no such thing as preordination at all. It's just a funny story that people made up because they couldn't deal with the fact that they had no free will and they wanted it, so they had to make up lots of contradictory stories rather than just saying free will is for me potential. It is not a realized fact. I have the potential for free will. I do not have it at this point in time. <clears throat> the closest personally that I can come to preordination, and it's nothing like preordination, is I will say that regardless of how we see things, Everything always does the will of the Creator. There is no way that it can be any other way. Okay? And that actually has nothing to do with free will. Or not. Uh, many people have said that one of the other attributes of this Creator is a tremendous love. Just a tremendous love. And yet if you look at the picture of man and say, this is the way he told us that things work, 
that if I go out and shoot someone, who actually shot them? We have no free will. We got to check them. Um, whether you have free will or not. Even if I have free will, if I go and shoot someone, who did it? I don't know how to run a body. Even if, it, even if I develop to the point where I do have free will, okay, and of my own free will, I say, I'm going to shoot you. Mm -hmm. Who will do it? All I did was say, that's what's true and valuable. X will have to do the job, won't he? So it's very clear that the capacity for free will is here. Mm -hmm. He will never, ever say no to anything that you say is true or valuable. The capacity is there, the potential is there, okay? Mm -hmm. That is actually an aspect of that love. He will never tell you, no, stupid idea. He loves you too much. Mm -hmm. Even if you want to do something, and he will have to do it, that is against his own principles, and he's made that very clear, that's against his principle. He doesn't like it when people do that. Some people asked him, how should we live? And he said, well, you could try not killing each other and <laughs> a few other things, you know, that he suggested that we do as a way of living. Isn't that right? Mm -hmm. And yet, the only way that people can, get, can be killed is because he did it. I said I wanted to, but he's got to actually do the deed. So free will is obviously there, the capacity for it. The reason that I don't have free will, I'll show you in, in a moment, it's because I'm not doing my job of being the awareness function. It's not because it's been denied to me. It's because I haven't finished developing the awareness. Any other questions or comments? If that thing went off, then that means we've been here for 45 minutes. I think that's a long, long enough time before we take a short break. Any other questions or observations? I know this is all very, like I said, theoretical and out there. Um, not all of this can we experiment at this moment, but I am, as I'm going along, making some effort. I don't know that I can demonstrate this one to you. This may take you a while to discover for yourself about where mankind is in its evolutionary state, okay? <clears throat> but certainly, uh, uh, if I can experiment with this and say perhaps this is a fact and discover for myself that my own sense of incompletion is because I drew a line right here and said there is nothing beyond that line. This is all that I am. And it's not true. And it makes me feel yucky having done that. Okay? So I can verify this part. <laughs> so you want to take a break? Good. Questions or comments during the break? Done with that? Mm -hmm. <coughs> to talk about man's evolution, we'll look at the stages that it's gone through so far. These things are a tad confused because of a lot of other forces that are going on. But I can see what stages mankind's evolution has gone through so far. The first, of course, was simply survival. <coughs> Which means that we did whatever we could to survive. It's called survival of the fittest. And if you get in my way, then I kill you. Um, if an animal gets in my way, I kill it. But that's basically the first stage of man's evolution, isn't it? Anything that gets in my way, <laughs> not anymore. And then at a certain point, <clears throat> we have achieved <clears throat> a 
another way of life that allowed us to introduce a new thing into our evolution called justice. <clears throat> Where it was no longer, if you do me wrong, I kill you. And said, if you do me wrong, I'm going to hurt you back. But no more than you hurt me. That was the original idea of justice, isn't it? And to some extent still is. Although there are a lot of people who still say, if you hurt me, I think you ought to be killed. So you can see that these things that are part of mankind's evolution, even though justice at a certain point in our evolution superseded survival, there are many of us who still live by the law of survival, isn't that right? That they're at a very low stage of evolution as human beings, individual human beings, one would say. Isn't that correct? That mankind's evolution has gone far beyond where a lot of individuals still remain. And then, <coughs> at a certain point, it was said, it is no longer appropriate even to live by the law of justice the way of justice, that we're going to evolve beyond that point to a thing called love, which is more properly called understanding. Love is not the kind of thing that most people believe it to be, where you have some warm and fuzzy feeling for somebody. It's really a badly translated word that means understanding when it's used in this sense. Okay? The kind of love that we're talking about is I understand you. So I don't need even justice from you. This kind of love says, I see <clears throat> that due to your place in the evolutionary scale, you thought this was an okay thing to do. I'm not so sure it really is, but I understand that it was to you. You honestly believed it to be proper. So there's absolutely no reason for me to even want justice from you. Because I understand that you're doing exactly what I do, what you think is proper. So this kind of love says, I understand that a human being can only act if they believe something to be right, proper, or justifiable. In other words, no one ever does anything they believe to be wrong even though we think that it's true, it's not. There is no way that you can hit someone if you think it's the wrong thing to do. Isn't that right? If somebody just arbitrarily says to you, go beat somebody up, you would just say, I, I can't do that. You would have to tell a very complicated story inside your head, wouldn't you, to make that okay. That's called a justification. Now, if you hit me first, then it's very easy to justify hitting you. Isn't that right? So basically, understanding says, I see that you found a way to justify this. I can see no way to justify doing anything back. You're doing something inappropriate doesn't justify me doing something inappropriate. Okay. That's called the way of love. That is <clears throat> the last stage of evolution that man was given a couple thousand years ago. A little fellow came along and said, okay, justice is over with. We ain't doing that here no more. We're evolving beyond that point. And those of us who are interested in man's evolution will start living love. There is yet another stage to man's evolution that is not very well known because it was never made public. It has existed for a very, very long time for individuals, but you can see that man is not even yet very good at doing this, is he? Much less going beyond. Many individuals throughout the history of mankind have gone on to the next stage of evolution for a human being. But mankind itself is still 
struggling with dealing this with this one, isn't he? <laughs> and that is consciousness or to put it into a more easily understood word, intelligence. But I don't mean the kind of animal cunning that most of us call intelligent, right? <clears throat> Which some have more than others. Some bodies are born with more of that cunning that passes for so-called intelligence. I sort of call it smarts around here, okay? Every animal has its own little smarts and uh, uses it to survive to the best of its ability. This is an entirely different thing. It's someone who has actually been transformed by love into someone who can play the game with infinite intelligence. In other words, has enough of a relationship with the source of all intelligence called acts. <clears throat> They're a very conscious being. And so when you look at them, all you see is this infinite intelligence acting. You no longer see that individual cunning animal playing the game. You see a very conscious awareness function that is doing its job extremely well. It's saying exactly what's going on with very few illusions. It's saying what is of value with very few illusions. And so what you see is the pure response of intelligence, spirit, X, whatever you want to call it because there are no illusions in the awareness itself, or very few. <clears throat> you see, with these ways, it's very easy for me to, to illuse or give an illusion, illusion to X, isn't it? I can say, I need to survive, and if you get in my way, it's okay to kill you. I'm living according to this way, and there are a lot of people doing that right now. Apparently some cop just got shot a few, a couple miles from here today. I saw about eight helicopters hanging out, very close to here. I'm sure when you get home and watch the news, you'll get to read about the terror of Glendale. <laughs> okay, there are a lot of people still living by this way of telling X what's going on. There are a lot of st people still living by this way. We have to do what's fair. <clears throat> there are a few who are living this way, and there are very few that are living this way. And yet this is the evolution that is possible for mankind and each of us individually. <clears throat> we have finally reached the point in the evolution of mankind that it is very, very difficult for an individual to go through this evolutionary process without seeing themselves in relationship to the whole of mankind. So throughout the ages, folks who talked about these ideas always made it a very personal thing. You do this. Today we can no longer do that. If you want to go very far in this game, you must become involved in the understanding of, that man himself is evolving and, be, and become in, involved in that game, the game of mankind's evolution, not just mine. Now, there's no way that I can make any contribution to mankind's evolution without evolving myself. So we're not suggesting that you run out and decide you know all about evolution and that you're going to do something <clears throat> However, I'm not certain that it's possible to get very far in this game anymore if you don't see the part of your life needs to be contributing to the evolution of mankind, not just an individual. And of course, if you don't want to get that far, then you can do whatever you like. In other words, I'm not telling you what you ought to do. I'm simply describing some things that have been said to me. Okay? I'm not saying you ought to do this. You can go as far as you want or stop wherever you like. It's not my business. If you want to go far, that's all I'm saying. But, 
it's very difficult now without getting involved in the evolution of man as a whole, because X is sort of getting really interested in that right now. He's playing some funny games with it. Have you ever heard the story that when you're in the womb, the body goes through what I believe is technically called recapitulation, where for a certain period of time it has gills and then it loses them and becomes amphibian and eventually takes on the form of a human being. So they say that it recapitulates the evolution of man in the womb. Each of us does that, goes through the whole evolutionary process of the form in a few months in order to create the form. You've heard about this, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, as I said, all things are a parable for things in the inner world. Each of us must do this exact same thing. We must go through this very step of evolution. We have to recapitulate, in a sense, the whole of man's evolution to evolve individually. So all of us have learned the law of survival, and I'm going to talk about that in a few minutes, what that is on an individual level. <clears throat> a few of us moved on and decided that justice and fairness was an terribly important thing, isn't that right? We get to a certain point in our life when we want everything to be fair. We want everything to be just. Very few of us have gone to the next step. Isn't that right? And I hope that none of you who are sitting here are still stuck in the way of survival because I'm not sure I want to... I don't mind taking people from here to here and maybe, you know, from here to here, but I'm not sure I want to deal with this, okay? You go do your justice thing all by yourself, all right? <clears throat> it's very wise and intelligent beings work very hard to get man to take this step. I think we can sort of do that part on our own, okay? These, these are tough. These next steps are tough because all of mankind has not yet done it, so we sort of have to do it on our own. We don't have a lot of support for it right now, because man simply hasn't evolved to that point yet. Okay? So we still need someone to guide us on that. Right? Most people can do this. Okay. And I suspect that most people are at least making an effort to make this leap of evolution in their lives. Isn't that about right? Maybe not doing it too good, because they don't have information that makes it possible. <clears throat> the one who gets to this level discovers that they are able to make a contribution to mankind's evolution as a whole. And it's no longer just about my little life and what I can do with it for me. <clears throat> that I can do that, and I can also say, what can this unique individual that's here do to contribute to the overall evolution of man, which is the real game going on here. Today. This whole show is actually about mankind as a whole, it's not about the individuals. That's very clear if you think about it. <clears throat> if X were that concerned with all the individuals, then things would be real different, wouldn't they? Everyone would be doing this. Obviously, what X is really concerned about is about mankind. Now, that does not say that he doesn't love each of us individually and will not do everything that we ask of him. It just says that his attention, quite clearly, is on man. Okay? Not the individual men and women that make up mankind. <coughs> Are there any questions or comments about that? Okay, I'm going to walk away from theory again for a moment.
and start dealing with something practical. <clears throat> but I did want to at least, oh, I didn't mention one little idea that's rather interesting. Um, again, this is something that human beings are aware of, even though they don't quite know what to do, do about it. And so, it, like most of the rest of the teaching, has been counterfeited into something absolutely useless that we do to occupy our time rather than evolve. And that's called, find a society that will be utopia. This is called the evolution of man. Man's proper evolution, according to what we've been told, is to find some way to create a perfect society where no one will want for anything, where everything will be lovely all the time, and everyone will lead beautiful, wonderful, productive lives. What they're producing, I have no idea. I guess the ability for somebody else to do it tomorrow. After all, we've already said that reproduction is the highest glory that man can aspire to. So I guess that's what you produce, is the possibility for somebody to come and do the same stupid thing tomorrow. And that's our idea of the evolution of mankind, isn't it? To find that perfect government, that perfect society, that perfect way of living here where everyone will be happy all the time. Good little sheep. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, to do that, you must lose your individuality. Is that not right? Can you see that? That in order to create that perfect world, you must fit into it? That we're creating not a perfect place for people, we're creating a perfect society for people. Which means you have to fit it. So you have to give up the most precious thing that you have, which is your individuality. The odd thing in the evolution of man from X's point of view is that you actually glorify your individuality. Because if we look back at the picture of man again, which we're going to do for a considerable time tonight. <clears throat> the awareness function is still a part of X. It never broke off, did it? It's still part of its creator. It's not separate, as we imagine. What is true is that by being in a physical body, the distraction of the senses is so great that we no longer experience ourselves as still being a part of the Creator. Isn't that right? All we can pay attention to is the sensory stuff that's going on all the time. And the stuff that is very, very subtle that's going on inside of me, I simply cannot even pay attention to. I'm not developed enough to deal with the gross, outrageous bombardment from the senses and these more subtle things at the same time. It takes a tremendous development of the consciousness. So. But I, we're still together. I never broke off. I'm not a separate created entity. I'm actually a little fragment of X that's being given the opportunity to develop itself into a very wonderful thing. What? We don't know yet. something that's going to come out lost. Ah, oh, yes. <clears throat> so, from X's point of view, the evolution of mankind is for this unique aspect of the Creator to develop itself fully, to actualize all of its potential so that it can contribute to the game of creation. So you're actually asked to be a unique individual. You're expected to become the unique individual thing that you are, as fully as you can. Which is real different than man's game of us all fitting a mold. Okay. So 
So to contribute to the evolution of man as a whole, you have to become yourself completely. Mm-hmm. And that's where the contribution comes from, is some unique talent that only you have. Because this part of X that is you is different than all the other parts of X that's everybody else. It's some unique thing about the Creator that's been incarnated into this particular body. It has some little thing about it that is completely different from everything else. So there's something that only it can do. <clears throat> Thus, man aids X in the creation of the universe, which is not finished yet. Before I get off onto some specific stuff, you kind of get this odd percent way of looking at things. I admit it's, it's a little odd. It's not exactly what we've been told. But I hope that if you can keep this in mind, <clears throat> that it may make the journey of creating and completing yourself a little bit easier by saying, I see it in relationship to what's going on. I'm not going to get lost in it. And believe me, there are billions of ways to get lost in this. <laughs> In other words, I need a direction, an aim, that can keep me on target. It is a very difficult thing to do, creating oneself. It takes tremendous work, and it's quite specific. It's very hard to talk to folks about it who haven't tried it yet but is a very specific thing. And it's not anything else. So it's very easy to get off on some other thing and think I'm doing it when in reality I'm not. Okay? And actually go back to the way that I've always lived, but I've learned to think about it in a new way, so I think I'm actually doing something different. So I'm hoping that maybe this will give us a, a way of seeing things that keeps us on target, that keeps us understanding the direction we're going in. Okay. So it will hopefully make it a tad easier to do the work that it takes to create oneself. So. <clears throat> I may refer to this again as we go along, just to keep it in perspective, but I don't know that for uh, quite a while I'm going to make it quite this clear, this overview again. I just want to make sure that you really understand it. Any questions, comments? One of the other things that we have real trouble with is that we do not understand the forces of creation. We know nothing about them. <clears throat> and so, by not understanding them, um, we make our lives unbearable. Because unfortunately, one of the forces of creation is perceived by us as the most horrible thing there is and we want it out of our life. And yet if it actually left my life, I might as well forget even being here. There would be no point. So we spend all of our life's energy trying to get rid of one of the forces of creation. That has become the entire purpose of most people's lives on planet Earth, is to get out of their life one of the forces that X has put into motion in the universe to allow the creation to occur on an individual level and on a universal level. And we want it gone. Okay. <coughs> Again, there's, we can see a parable to this if you know anything about physics. One of the things that's known is that when you get down to the very smallest place that we can deal with at this point in our understanding, 
you do not find what we believed we would find. We believed we would find two forces, because that's what we believe in, isn't it? We believe that to create, you generate a cause, and you get an effect. Isn't that right? Yes. That permeates every point of view that we have towards living, is the belief that creation exists from two forces. Isn't that right? And it's not true. You ask any physicist what they've discovered, and they found there are four forces at the heart of all things. Okay? Now these forces permeate the entire creation, because they are the forces that were used to do the creation, and they're still here, they're still present, because the creation is still going on. <clears throat> but we only see the first one and the last one, the cause and the effect. We don't see the middle two. And we hate the second one. <laughs> I'm going to talk more about these forces of creation later, but I am going to point out where the second force that we know nothing about except in quantum physics, we know nothing about it in a personal level, in our own lives, this force of creation that is always present, thank goodness, so that I can develop and create myself and actualize my potential, <clears throat> we see it as disturbance. The way that we see the action of the second force of creation is that it comes into my life and makes everything into a living hell. It comes along and no matter what I do, something always comes along and disturbs me. Isn't that right? No matter what you do, sooner or later, disturbance will show up in your life. Isn't that right? That is our experience of the second force of creation. Now, later, like I say, we'll put words on this and, and try and understand what it really is, but I think we need to look at the way we see it right now before we even try to understand what it is. And the gist of that is that since I came from a place where there was no disturbance, isn't that right? Called my mama's womb, which was this lovely place where disturbance never happened, from my point of view. It seems to have disturbed her a lot. <laughs> but from my point of view, it was great. Isn't that right? I was never hungry. I was never cold. I was never hot. You were always wet. <laughs> but I didn't <laughs> care. You're right. <clears throat> I was never disturbed. I didn't even know the bodies had needs. Isn't that right? Everything was supplied before I needed it. So I didn't even know there was such a thing as getting a craving or a desire. It was a lovely place. And then I come here, and here the second force of creation is very active. And I'm constantly disturbed. And so each one of us <coughs> made a decision right about the time of birth, which was that the purpose of my life is to regain the non-disturbed state. In other words, to resist the second force of creation and try and get rid of it. Now, purpose is everything that I do. That is the purpose for my life. It is no longer my purpose to evolve into a created, completed being. My purpose is to get rid of the second force of creation. So I actually don't want to evolve. I want to remain the cripple that I am right now. Now, it's only a cripple if it isn't growing, isn't that right? If it's growing, then you cannot call it a cripple. To call uh, an infant a cripple because it can't walk yet is stupid, isn't it? 
But if that infant says, I'm going to stay the way I am for the rest of my life, my rest of my time on planet Earth, then I start to call it a cripple. Isn't that right? I don't want to become uh, responsible. I don't want to have to walk around. I want everybody to do like they're doing now and just bring it to me. With no effort on my part. Well, now this person has become a cripple, haven't they? They took a glorious thing, which is growing up and developing, and turned it into a terrible thing. Because they decided not to grow. Okay? So everything that a human being does, every single action that they take, whether they realize it or not, and of course they don't, is an attempt to bring about a state where there is no disturbance in my life. <clears throat> every time disturbance comes along, I look for a way to get rid of it. Isn't that right? That's what my life is about. I have forgotten, in other words, why I came here, what I'm doing. And I decided that the purpose of my life is to get rid of the forces that are here to allow me to grow and develop into a created, completed human being. Okay? And we develop some ways of doing that. It's called surviving. Each of us is given, without charge, the way of survival. Okay? We all do that uh, just naturally without even knowing we're doing it. <clears throat> the first one is that I make a decision that is important to have my way now. My way would be to be non-disturbed. This is the way that I'm going to get what I want out of life. To say, if only I had my way now, then I would have what I want out of life, which is non-disturbance. In other words, I could go on being a cripple, and it wouldn't matter. Everyone else would take care of me. Kind of like the infant that says, I don't want to walk. Okay. And the way to get it is to complain. Now you can see that this is a survival decision for a child, isn't it? If the child didn't complain when it was disturbed, it would die. Because it can't do anything for itself. It can't tell people, I'm hungry. Couldn't speak the language yet. It can't say, um, you know, I think I might die if you leave that safety pin stuck inside of me, you know, because it kind of carries these little germs, and I'll have to, you know, I can't just nicely say that. It's got to just let out a yowl, so you try and figure out what's going on. Isn't that right? So this is called a survival decision, isn't it? <clears throat> and as part of the game, X creates infants' bodies with a very unique ability. And that is the ability to make a sound that drives adult human beings nuts. <laughs> Isn't that right? Only infant children can make this sound. Have you noticed that? There's nothing else on planet Earth except a few other things that sort of remind us of. It's like squeaking your fingers on a chalkboard. You're lucky I don't have one. <laughs> but they can make a sound that is guaranteed to grate on the nerves of every adult human being around. Isn't that right? So complaining works for them. It drives us insane, and we immediately rush over there and find out what's wrong to shut them up, because it disturbs us. And so our purpose comes up and says, I must stop this disturbance. That doesn't mean we don't love them. I'm not saying that we don't love them. That's not the point. But you can see that this is a perfect survival decision for a child, isn't it? Except, thank goodness, we all lose that ability. A very short time later, and complaining stops working. Isn't that right? You complain, and everybody just says, Would you shut <laughs> up? <laughs> a friend stopped by, in fact, earlier this evening. 
who is one of those people that is constantly complaining. We all know them. They, they never grew out of this. Not that many of us have. We do it. But most of us do it you know, in, in nicer ways. But this person is always complaining about everything. And every so often I just say, would you stop complaining? Please, for two minutes, you're driving me insane. You know, and, and they kind of tone it down for a little while. We can't do it for very long. But it does. It's just after a while, you just want to like, choke them, to stop them. Isn't that right? It don't work anymore. It doesn't get you your way. But we're still living by this way of survival. We have not evolved beyond that point, have we? And after doing this for a certain period of time, <clears throat> this infant awareness that only has the potential to perceive the facts and only has the potential to put proper value on the facts. You see, that's the main reason why we don't value this force of, of creation. It does disturb me. There is no doubt about it. The second force of creation is quite disturbing. But because I am uncreated or incomplete or unfinished, I'm not very good at valuing things that are actually extremely valuable. If later on I find out that this is the force of creation, then I can begin to look at that and say, wow, this is the most wonderful thing in my life, even though it disturbs me very much. This is beginning to develop now, isn't it? It's seeing things properly in perspective of the way things are, and it's learning to have a new way of valuing things. That's called growing up, which most of us have never done. Okay? But it's quite understandable that in its infant, incomplete state, that it would make a lot of boo-boos. It's just not very good at doing its job yet. So I'm not putting anyone down for doing this, because as I say, each of us must recapitulate this. Okay? Just as the physical body had to do it in the womb, each of the awarenesses for its own growth must recapitulate the growth of man's evolutionary process. So we all go through this. It's absolutely essential. The question is, will we ever move on to the third step? <laughs> Each of us has done the first and second. It's a gift that's given to you. <clears throat> because this is where mankind's evolution is right now, is on working on this. So this has been done as far as man is concerned. We have evolved beyond this point. So this part of evolution is just given to you as a natural gift. This you have to work for until man evolves to the point where that comes naturally. Then everyone will have to work for this. As it is, we now have to work for both of them. And as I said, the transition from the third to the fourth right now seems to require seeing what we just got through talking about and making a contribution to man's overall evolution. But at any rate, we then make another decision based on this infant, unrealized ability to see what's true and valuable, and we look around and we say, every time I complain, pretty much, somebody does something about it for me, so I have rights. And it does look that way, doesn't it? I have the right to this. I'm entitled to this. I'm entitled to be taken care of. And it is important that I stick up for my rights. Because if I had all my rights, then where would I be? Not disturbed. So it's important that I have these rights and that I make sure that I keep them and that if anybody ever tries to take them away from me, I will stand up and immediately and very violently, most of the time, assert my rights. Okay. This is the law of survival. It gets pretty violent, doesn't it? And yet the silly thing is, I don't actually have those rights that I claim to have. But it 
word right means something that I am entitled to that cannot be taken from me. And I have no such thing. What do I have that cannot be taken from me? Okay. I don't even have a right to be alive. Much less all the other things I imagine to be my rights. But I still am living by this way of understanding things, aren't I, which is very limited. It says, the way to have a good life is to go around constantly asserting your rights and making sure no one takes them away from you. And all it really does is create tremendous conflict with others, doesn't it? Every time I assert my right, I've actually taken something from you, which is your right to do what you wanted to do. So unfortunately, the only way I can have my rights is to take away your rights. So we live in a competitive, violent world because everyone is playing this game. A person who lives only by the law of survival, which around here we call A, is the part of us, the part of the awareness function that lives by the law of survival. Okay. <clears throat> Someone who lives only this way is a very violent person. Because they see that the way to get what I want, which is to be non-disturbed, and of course you're constantly disturbing me, or at least a lot of the time, is to go and confront you and complain to you about how miserable a person you are because you keep disturbing me and tell you what's wrong with you and demand that you change and stick up for my rights that you've taken away, which is very violent behavior, isn't it? <clears throat> so each of us <clears throat> is sort of forced to create new decisions on what we call the B side of man, which is the way of justice. And this says, <clears throat> if you want to be non-disturbed, it is important that I please others. Because when I please them, they stop disturbing me. That's exactly how we were kind of conned into making this decision, isn't it? If you don't stop disturbing me, your parents said, I will disturb you until you please me. Isn't that right? All of us got that. Didn't all of your parents do that at some point? In fact, if you've got kids, you probably did it to them. Isn't that right? I would. I don't want this little violent monster living with me. Of course I'm going to teach them <coughs> another way of understanding, which is please others. And they please you back. I mean, that is the concept here, isn't it? That if I pleased you enough, justice says that you would please me back. You would stop disturbing me. You would do things to make my life more comfortable. Of course, it doesn't work too good because I kind of like you pleasing me and I don't particularly want to please you. So as long as you're willing to please me, then now with you. So as long as we live in a world that has no understanding, the you know, way of justice doesn't work too good, as we're well aware, isn't that right? We have not really reached this level yet, and this isn't uh, working real good. It's better than going around killing each other, but it isn't exactly a workable way of living, is it? But now I am in conflict, inner conflict. I've been split down the middle. And I can't do them both at the same time. So even though I have two ways of getting what I want, they're in conflict, aren't they? It does not please you when I complain about you and tell you what's wrong with you and stick up for my rights. So now I get real confused. I don't know what to do anymore. Every time I try to decide how to get what I want, I don't know what's right because I'll always have at least two answers. One from this side, 
the way of justice, the one from the other side, the way of survival. And one says, go out and take it, and the other side says, no, 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 you get it by trading something of equal value. Isn't that right? And so this little war goes on inside my head all the time about which one to do. And so I get further fragmented, and I have to create another thing inside me that we call the mind or the ego, which around here we call the chooser. <clears throat> and what happens is that all these ideas go through the awareness and talk to the chooser and say, I know how to get it, I know how to get it. And the chooser sits there, we can experience that as constant thought. And the chooser has to figure out which one is true and valuable so that we can tell X we're going to do that. So I am in, at this point, a less than enviable state, am I not? All because I refused to experience the second force of creation. Isn't that funny? I decided to buy the story that happens on planet Earth that I'm finished, that I'm complete, or that if I feel incomplete, it just means I haven't found the proper mate, and that we all know what the game of life on planet Earth is about. It's about becoming a productive member of society so we can work on to the day when we have the perfect utopia and we're all busy in the midst of that denying the force of creation that would allow us to do something much more interesting than any of that. Yes ma'am? So if we were, it's not the experiencing of it and the reporting that I don't like this it's the fact that you think you have to control it. You're trying to actually stop it. You're resisting it. Right. Okay. You're trying to stop it. And it cannot be stopped. So it destroys you. Right. It, what I'm... Right. It's the fact that you're trying to stop it. Right. Not that you have an, Not that you look and you go, I don't like this. No, of course not. Uh, many times I don't like it. Stop it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'll admit it. I don't always like it. But I do see it as valuable because it's what allows me to create something, whether it be me or anything else in the world that I do. It doesn't say I have to like it. It just says don't try to stop it. Okay. And it is probably better if I can actually learn to like it because that shows a very high degree of development of the valuing function that I can not only say this is disturbing, but say I like being disturbed. That is a very high degree of evolution of the valuing function. It's begun to see something in an entirely new way and value things in a way that it would be considered basically being human. Isn't that right? What do you mean you like pain? You like things that bug everybody. Well, yeah, I think they're really wonderful. I'm not saying one should be there. That's not the point. I'm just saying that that would be a very high degree of evolution of the valuing part of the awareness, which right now is very underdeveloped. It exists mainly in potential. It's not very good at valuing things. Okay? But it would be a higher degree of evolution than the way we are now to say, I don't like this, but it's okay. I will not try to stop it. So you're absolutely correct. I'm just pointing out further, not saying what you said is incorrect. You're absolutely correct. <clears throat> One who can actually do that and not just say it as a little story in the head, but actually see this disturbance and say, this is what is helping me create. And even though it bothers me, it disturbs me, I don't want it to go away. That would be a, a much more involved awareness function than most. And as we'll see as we go through some more of these ideas, and those of you who have heard them before know this is true, this attempt to resist the second force of creation actually destroys you. 
So not only do you remain incomplete and uncreated, you actually destroy yourself by trying to stop the process of creation. And again, if you think, if you consider it, it makes perfectly good sense. If you look at this lovely parable out here, if a plant decided that water was the most terrible thing there was and said, I'm never going to drink, would it grow or would it simply die? If I won't allow to come into my life what I need to create myself as an evolved, growing being, then I will not only not evolve, I will die. Be careful when you leave, they're having weird fun over there. <laughs> if you see any people running down the street, they just, you know, like, zoom off. <laughs> Don't stop and find out what's going on. <laughs> Okay, <clears throat> I think this is as far as we're going to go with this tonight. It's getting kind of light. We'll finish it up. There's much more to this than what we've put up here so far. Not a lot, but we've done about half of it at this stage. This is all stuff that I can check out. I can see, I can begin a new kind of thing where I attempt to look at self and understand self. In other words, I can begin practicing the third level of evolution. Because isn't that the way that anybody does anything in this world? When you can't do something, you practice it until it's real. Isn't that right? That's how I learned to play the piano. I didn't sit down one day and say playing the piano would be good and toss off you know, a little Mozart. I sat and spent years pretending I could play the piano. That's called practice. So I could begin to practice the next stage of evolution, which is to see with understanding what is going on. And I can start to use the teaching ideas to look at the inner man, the inner awareness, and say, is this true? Is this what's going on in my life? Am I living or attempting to live at the same time by two different ways of seeing, which are contradictory? This way says you get what you want by just going out and beating everybody up until you get it, and if you got to kill them, we'll fight. And this way says, no, 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 you do it by trading something of equal value. You don't just by kill them to take what you want. You give them something of value for it. And you can't do them both. Is it true that all I want in my life is to be non-disturbed? You see, these are all things that I can begin to look inside of what's going on and say, is this true? A lot of the other stuff we're going to have to leave as opinion for a while. <laughs> Isn't that right? But this I can certainly begin to look at. I think we can certainly see at least that these things exist on planet Earth. We may not know whether that's truly man's evolution or not, but we can certainly, I think, look out there and see what's been going on. And saying when we look at the people who claim that they have higher ideas for man, they've all sort of talked about these things, haven't they? I mean, it's very clear in the Judaic Christian thing. I mean, a certain point they made up all these game rules didn't they and said you must live by the law that's where they switched over to the way of justice isn't that right and then at a certain point another man came along and said eh, you know justice is okay but let's try to live by understanding so it's very very clear in some places but i guarantee you if you look into it enough you will see the same thing repeated over and over everywhere that anyone has said, I have some ideas from a higher intelligence. Okay? And this I can certainly verify for self, and that's exactly what we must do for these ideas to, to work. And I, I'm hoping you can get some understanding of why that is. You're actually practicing the next stage of your evolution at this point. By attempting to understand yourself, you're practicing 
the next stage of your evolution, that at a certain point it won't be practicing anymore. You will have evolved. Then maybe you can practice this, the fourth step. Okay. So you practice by seeing with understanding. <clears throat> by seeing yourself asking A and B for their opinion about how to get non-disturbed. Right. And then trying to choose between them. Right. And then letting them tell you how you chose wrong. <laughs> so That's exactly right. There is a certain point, if you like, we can talk about this, because I'm sure you've probably experienced it, but there is a certain point where it stops being practicing, and it becomes a very real thing where that degree of understanding is there. It's no longer practicing, and then we must move on to other kinds of understanding to practice, so that eventually we can say, I have been transformed into one who no longer lives by the way of survival or the way of justice. I now live the way of understanding. I'm a different kind of person than I was when I started this game. Okay. And there are many little signposts along the way that say that one is beginning to be transformed into that, but we want to eventually be able to say, I've been transformed into this. And perhaps even say, I would like to move on. And find out what it's like to be a conscious, intelligent being who is making a conscious, intelligent contribution to what's going on here. I'm no longer just in this for me. I am in it for me. Don't misunderstand. <laughs> it's just that's not all that's going on. Whereas someone who could, is playing this game and I don't want non-disturbance, really, that's all that's going on in their lives is what's in it for me. The only thing I care about is that everything stop disturbing me. If it looks like I'm being noble, it's because I'm following this, hoping that it'll get me that. I'm following the way of justice, hoping that it will get me non-disturbance. So, repeat it for the people on the tape. <laughs> We're here right now, but they believe it. <laughs> I just realized they can't exactly see me pointing at them. <laughs> <laughs> It's all about me wanting non-disturbance, and I believe I have two ways of doing it. And it's very clear that I don't, <laughs> because I'm constantly being disturbed. Well, of course, because that is the force that creates. When I learn to stop resisting that force and embrace it and allow it into this life, this stops being practicing. It becomes just the way I am. Okay. Any other questions, observations? Are we done for tonight? Yes, sir. Are, there, are the four forces in any way analogous to these forces of creation? No. <coughs> um, not in the sense they. All the things that we look at that are being created or are created, you're seeing those four forces in that particular thing. Okay, so yes, these are the four forces, but in the evolution of man. Okay, this is the first force, this is the second, and third, and fourth. Mm -hmm. um, we're in the process, as I said, of trying to make this one a very powerful force. These two are quite strong right now. We're trying to make this one very powerful in the hopes that one day this one will become a very powerful force as well. Mm -hmm. So it's not finished yet. But yes, in all things that you look at, you can see these four forces. In a human being, the first force is X, second force is awareness, third force is the body, and fourth force is what I do. Okay, cause and effect. Okay, the first force is the creator which causes and the effect is what I do as a human being isn't mm -hmm. that right but in between there's two other things that we don't see 
and everything that you look at that is either created or in the process of creation, you see those four forces at work. Do you understand what I was asking? Is, but do the, in the unified field theorem, do these relate to those four forces? Yes. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. They're the exact same four forces operating okay. on a different level. Um, we're talking about the way they operate on the level of human being, consciousness. Okay. But yes, they are exactly the same forces. I know they have odd words for them that don't make much sense to us, but that's because they're working on a very detailed mm -hmm. level that we don't normally experience. Mm -hmm. But yes, absolutely. <clears throat> so human beings have known this a lot longer than there have been scientists. Yeah. You know how I know this? No. There's a very old object in the Egyptian desert called the Sphinx. Mm -hmm. What is it? It's a pyramid. No. It is a being that is composed of four animals. Do you suppose those people were representing something that they knew thousands of years ago? Long before there were quantum physicists? Well, they're in the spiritual literature of all any number of traditions. Over the place. But yes. the Sphinx is one of the oldest objects that we know of on planet mm -hmm. Earth. Did you know that? No, I didn't. Older it than was, the writings? Mm. Mm -hmm. It was built long before the pyramids. Mm. Thousands of years before the pyramids were built, mm -hmm. to the best of our knowledge. So it's very clear that man has known about this from the moment he arrived planet Earth, or evolved, or whatever word you want to call it. He's known about this for thousands upon thousands of years. We didn't exactly need quantum physics, physics to tell us. X told us this a long time ago. But it is kind of nice today, seeing, seeing it come out in, in, in new ways. And I think it's interesting. We're living in an interesting time right now. Any other questions or comments? Okay, so I will talk about this more next week. But so if I want to actually use these ideas, I really must begin this practice of looking in self and seeing if I can see what we've talked about so far in, in, in the actuality. Not as a theory, but an actual perception. I see it. I see the constant complaining going on. I see the constant sticking up for rights. I see the trying to please to get my way. Okay, and I see the conflict that that creates. And one day we, that will bring us an understanding. You get it. Okay. Good. Okay. Well, it was lovely having you.